photographer recently graduated from Oregon State University. Yes. Uh, so you were in the art program. Mm -hmm. And maybe is the microphone on? Um, oh, yes. There it is. <laughs> Took it a while. <laughs> and um, how would you describe your style, subject matter, etc., of photography that you studied in the art program of Oregon State University? Yeah, so I was lucky actually a lot of the things I learned about um, when I was in school, a lot of the professors uh, taught us a lot about conceptual photography and documentary photography, um, which ended up being actually a lot what I liked doing in my own work, especially documentary photography. Um, I really enjoyed that kind of straightforward nature of photographing something and then it ended up helping a lot with the subject matter that I ended up looking into more and developing my work with more. Um, that really straightforward approach I think helped a lot with uh, making my work which was really nice but that was something that I learned quite a bit about in my classes and stuff at OSU and yeah that. What attracted you to photography in the first place? I actually been a huge fan of photography since I was a kid. Um, I wanted a, we always got those little disposable cameras yeah. when I was younger, ever since I was, gosh, at least five. Like my uh, mom would get one for me and my three siblings and we would just kind of always take pictures at my grandma's. It was always the summer trip that we would because um, I have a bunch of family over in Minnesota and so we would visit and I'll be together and I was over there taking like these overexposed high <laughs> flash photos of the most bizarre things but I was really drawn to that and I always loved seeing like the result and when the film came back I was always like, oh my gosh. Um, and then when I was nine I got my first camera. It was like a little $20 <laughs> one in plastic, like a pink Fuji film something. Yeah, it was one of those I and I loved it immediately and would have like little bake sales and stuff and ended up saving up for a nicer camera. It was like a hundred bucks or something at the time. But I just kind of kept upgrading the camera. And then when I was in high school, uh, I actually started doing sports photography because that was what my younger brother, he was in all sorts of sports. So I just kind of, my passion kept growing for it. And then when I was 16, I started dual enrolling at the college in my hometown. And I was lucky enough, uh, they had photography classes at this small little college in North Idaho. And the professor was amazing, Jessica, um, and she really taught me a lot about just kind of basics with photography. I learned how to shoot my camera in manual, which was <laughs> nice. Um, and she kind of helped me realize that it was something I could go to college for and I could pursue as an actual career. Uh, and that kind of all led to me ending up choosing OSU and it kind of all went from there, but yeah. Do, do I hear correctly that from early on, from your pink camera days mm -hmm. on, um, you've been interested in a documentary slant about people? Yeah, yeah, I've always loved photographing people. I would <laughs> even, for when I was little, I would always be like smile and taking all these like ridiculous photos of everything, but I loved how you could just capture like those moments with people that I felt, to me, it fit the most. Like when I would paint people or draw people, I've never had much of a knack for painting or drawing but I always came back to photography and that was always the thing that I just loved doing and I loved capturing those little moments as like corny as it is to say that but I really did enjoy that aspect of it. Corny it was, is quite often true. Yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if it fits yeah it was something yeah. I just really so loved. So you started back in the day that uh, pre-digital mm -hmm. uh, photography what do you like better? It's it's hard. I think up until I graduated, I always definitely loved digital more because when I was younger, I used like the little disposable cameras, which still have a special place <laughs> in my heart. My roommate actually uses them to this day. Um, but when I was at OSU, I was really drawn to digital because a lot of the work that I did, um, I did a lot of documentary work, but I also did a lot of staged work when I was at OSU, and so it was a lot of setup things. And using digital kind of helped with that because I could take the photos and kind of 
work with it and look at them. And then so immediately you look if you like yeah, the set. Yeah, which helped a lot. And then actually after graduating, I've kind of, since I've been taking not a break from fine art stuff, but I've been working more with just kind of stuff that I have fun with as balancing it out more that I have, now that I have time for it. And I've been getting really into film again also, which has been kind of a fun discovery to um, find. I've been using my grandpa's old Minolta camera <laughs> from however many decades ago, and I've been using my a bunch of old expired film actually that my grandma had in her basement. And so that's been kind of fun working with. But I would say I have love for both of them. They're just very different. Like I like, digital probably more for my fine artwork and then I prefer film just for messing around and having fun with it. Do you think they're totally different art forms? I approach them differently because the way I look at it and I've always have looked at it is the materials I'm using I feel like speak a lot to the work I'm making and so in a lot of my projects the materials and the processes that I'm using I feel play a role in the work that I'm making and so whatever feels like it fits the project the best I use and so like I was I would I've been using the old expired film for example and I've been kind of photographing places around town as I'm getting closer to moving mm -hmm. and so that's been kind of a fun way because like the old expired film I feel like kind of goes hand in hand with you know these old pieces of my past that I'm kind of putting to the side for now and then going forward and then you know, like I was saying before, like a lot of my digital work, having the digital aspect of it and having the immediacy of it helps a lot. And so I approach them differently. While I feel like they're both obviously still photography and they both document things, I think that both of the processes can be used in different ways for different projects and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I approach that. But yeah. But what was your first time that you said, yeah, I'm going for this? Oh, that's, it was honestly probably, it was my first class when I went, um, it was, there's actually kind of two parts to this. Before I went to OSU, I had a final for my beginning photography class, and I was just so proud of the final. And it was, you know, just macro photos of plants or something like that. Like, it didn't have any deep meaning, but I remember doing that project and I was like, this is what I really love to do. I was like, I just really enjoy it and I love making things and I love seeing where my camera takes me and kind of stuff like that and I really enjoyed that and that was when I made the decision to go to college and then when I actually started at OSU, um, after my freshman year, when it was getting into more major specific courses and upper division courses at the time i was still actually majoring in education and in photography and i actually spoke with evan about uh evan baden my professor i spoke with him about you know career paths and what i wanted to do in the future and the more i thought of it the more i realized that i really did want to keep making art more than i wanted to necessarily choose another career path with it like teaching because at the time I was still seeing like, oh, I could do both. But then once I started talking with him about it, I was like, no, I kind of like to do this. So teaching was teaching in general? Te I, it was elementary teaching. Oh, so okay. I was like going okay. into elementary so education. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I would still love, that's actually something I'm hoping to do maybe someday in the future, teach. Because I do genuinely enjoy working with people and doing things like that. Um, and those throwaway cows. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, so after I had that talk, I was really thinking about what I wanted to do post-graduation, and I started to realize that I just loved art, and it was something that I wanted to focus more of my time on. And so, yeah, then I ended up dropping the elementary education major, and I added an art history minor, and just kind of went full art path, but it was very fun, and <laughs> I'm happy I did it. All right. And so you didn't fall into the black Hall of post-graduation, now what? I mean, I think everyone does at least a little bit. I'm not gonna lie, if I'm being totally honest, it was like, well, what am I, like it was really, it wasn't as much I wasn't sure if I wanted to do art because I knew I wanted to do art. It was more what art do I want to make that makes me happy and makes me creative and want to keep making things, you know, because I think I'm sure a lot of people who went to art school can understand, you know, when you're in school, you're doing a lot of assignments for 
classes and for a specific prompt. And so it was kind of nice, actually, once I graduated, I could start to look at art and just kind of think like, what do I want to do? And so I started making, like just messing around with photography things. I started painting and drawing again, which I haven't done in years, but I've been getting into that and just kind of working with art in general and kind of seeing where my path goes and kind of seeing where so my ideas So what is the camera lead. that you like best? Oh, I have been needing an upgrade. I have a old Nikon DSLR right now and then I also have a mirrorless Olympus camera which both work very well. Um, they're kind of breaking down a little bit. Um, but if I had to pick a favorite camera, honestly, I'd have to go with my old Minolta film camera. And I think I just love it because of the history of it. You know, it was my grandpa's and then they passed it down to me. And I just love how, how much history, especially old film cameras have. I think that they're so fun to work with. Um, yeah, and I've also used large format film and stuff in some of my classes and that's very fun to work with. I haven't been able to a whole lot, but yeah, film cameras do still hold a special place in my heart. So, so let's talk a little bit about the project that you're uh, exhibiting now. It's the title of the show is Us Two. Yes. Uh, or hashtag, hashtag Us Two. Yeah, us, yeah. Us Two. Um, what is the story you want to tell? Yeah, well, a big reason I started the project is because I was seeing a lot of the women in my life struggling with um, issues of sexual harassment, assault and abuse and things like that. And um, when I started the project, I was actually taking a documentary course at the time and I was thinking, I was like, what do I want to talk about in my work? And then, you know, I started to look at the conversations that women were having in my life and how much sexual harassment, assault, and abuse was such a normalized, kind of accepted thing in conversations, and that really caught my eye because it's something I had experienced, you know, my freshman year, I had had three experiences with sexual assault, unfortunately, and it was just something that I felt like I needed to process, and I felt like there were a lot of people in my life who had also been through that, but there wasn't a whole lot of discussion on it. Like there is, I feel like with large organizations, but not in everyday conversations. And so when I started the project, I was like, okay, I really wanna document this in a really straightforward manner to just kind of shine a light on it more than anything. And I think that that's something that I still am trying to do as much as I can with my work and with this project in general is just bring a light to these kind of nuanced conversations around sexual harassment, assault and abuse, kind of just expose them for how real and everyday and raw they really are and just kind of, yeah, talk about that in my work with that. <laughs> I'll answer that question. Right, and so what is the, the style that you chose for that? Yeah, um, so this is actually something that I kind of stuck with, my project has changed and evolved quite a bit over the past few years. Like I was only a sophomore when I started the project and now it's definitely changed over the past, gosh, three, almost four years now, it's been a while. Um, but uh, something I really wanted to do ever since the beginning was really photograph the different categories of work in a very straightforward, non-elaborate manner. Like, I didn't see any of the subject matter having to be made to look a certain way or made to look more dramatic or made to look more this or more that because to me, I saw the power in the photos in the simplicity of them and the everyday nature of them. And so, for example, when I was photographing the clothes, the women wearing the clothes, I just wanted to draw attention to the clothes and just show them for what they are because that was actually something that came up quite a bit. I would have people saying, oh, well, they're wearing sweatpants oh, well, they're wearing a work uniform, and it would just kind of be like, oh, like, all the, and I was like, yeah, like, it happens everywhere. People just don't realize it. And so... You mean they were not in, in a super short skirt? Yeah, and, yeah, and exactly. It was everyday top. clothes. It was everyday clothes. It wasn't, yeah, a mini skirt with a bra when they're going, like, it wasn't anything like that. It was always very everyday, like, pajamas or... Like, like one of them is Mickey Mouse pajamas and another, like they're all just such normal everyday clothes. 
And it was the same with the locations as well. When I was photographing them, you know, it would be like, yeah, it was bedrooms. I photographed bedrooms quite a bit, but it would also be someone's car or a bar or uh, someone's place of work. Like it was all these very, very mundane looking things. And I wanted to highlight that because when you're driving by, say you're driving by this house, you wouldn't think twice about driving by some random house or think twice about, you know, going into this, store that you go into every day but for some people these places hold such a heavy place in their heart for them and so i really just wanted to document it in that kind of mundane straightforward way just to show like yeah this place it may look normal but it holds so much more for other people and i didn't feel the need to have to like dramatize that because it felt like it was already heavy enough as it is mm -hmm. yeah uh, you have uh, within this bigger series a series called Weapons, and I picked two um, examples out of that. Partly these two, uh, because they are not necessarily look well, the keys look a little bit as a weapon here. With the keychain and everything I know is here. <laughs> but um, so these are weapons, mm -hmm. but they are so not menacing yeah or you don't have to have a permit for them uh-huh um could you tell us a little bit uh, about the one on the left yeah, yeah that that you would have to think about twice yeah for sure the one on the left is actually um a drug tester which is kind of it's sad but that's even something that people have to carry around but it's actually like a little patch and the person was explaining it, you peel off the top and if you're at a bar, say you can dip your finger in your drink and touch the swab and like in a few minutes it'll tell you if it's been drugged or not. Um, and it's really, it looks so just normal oh, and, then you, yeah, and then you learn about it and it's like, oh my goodness. Um, can you imagine sitting in a bar going out having fun? Mm -hmm. And this guy looks kind of attractive and he's buying you a drink and you have, now to, you have, have to, to whip test out it. the little drug tester. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, how's that going to go down? Oh, it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's hard to think about, especially with those ones, the weapons series within the project, I think is such an interesting one to process because just looking at them, you know, if you were just looking at them normally, they would look like everyday items. And so that was one thing that came up in the photographing of it was trying to figure out how to photograph it in a way that looked <clears throat> so they wouldn't get mistaken just as normal things but then also it would just make it look like a normal because that is some way like a lot of women carry their keys in between their fingers and like there are these things that hold so much more meaning for the people carrying them and they hold so much fear for them and stuff i think too it's it's a really loaded <laughs> i think the mindset of somebody needing to hold their keys in such a way that it could be used as a weapon at any moment mm -hmm. uh, is is a sad uh, comment on yeah so your style is very clean and and understated mm -hmm. um, is, you mentioned that that was because you don't feel the need to dramatize it more, mm -hmm. and, and that's a very good point. But I also wanted to speak about the presentation mm -hmm. of your work because it's, it's an important thing in artwork, much more important than most people realize. Mm -hmm. So those two are part of a politic. I have to look that word up. Yeah. After <laughs> triptych, there's no, it's poly, oh. or a lot. Yeah. Um, it's it, without frames, it's, and your other work is without frames, directly mm -hmm. on the wall, minimal um, uh, jazzing up of no frames. But you also have on your lap another opportunity for um, presenting photographs. Mm -hmm. And do you think you can manage yeah, to yeah. show yeah. us that uh, and tell us a little bit about it? It's a, it's going to be published soon yeah. by a new press and in Corvallis, uh, started by Avon Bader, <laughs> uh, the ph photography professor at OSU, mm -hmm. and um, 
print enthusiast. Yes. <laughs> um, what's the name of the press? Uh, Push Pull Editions. Push yeah. Pull Edition. Yeah, no. I think we really have to look for that press in the future. Uh, Lee Mimi, uh, and one of your fellow students, yeah, yeah. is going to have a book in that press too. Okay. Is my understanding? Not that we talk about. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, scratch that. <laughs> I think Lee Super might be loud. making. I think Lee might be making their own book. I think oh, I saw okay. something about it that okay. they posted. Yeah. All right. I misunderstood. That. <laughs> That's okay. Um. Yeah. Sorry. You can go. Yeah. So you have a. Why a book? Well, I really something that was important to me since I started the book was making sure that uh, the survivors' stories were displayed with the work in some way. Um, so with all the photographs that I actually made, they're all based off of an interview that I did with a survivor of sexual harassment, assault, or abuse. And so I have just transcripts and transcripts and transcripts of conversations with these people. And I really, to me, the way I looked at the project was, yes, the photographs are extremely important. I am a photographer, but with this specific project, the text felt just as, for, as important to me as the photos did. And so it was important to me that I ended up making something where the photos could be displayed with the text and they could just be paired together. And, you know, as I started to take bookmaking when I was in school, I started to realize that that could be a really good way for somebody to see the images with the text. And something I really liked about the a book format also is that each of the photos with their stories could be isolated. So like when you're going from one to the next you know you're not seeing it all in a gallery you're seeing this one person with their story and i thought that that fit really well and so i was lucky i had the opportunity where i was able to make this into a book um and yeah i know it's separated in the book into the three sections and the separations are made by the red pages which just say the series title and then it has little notes, so for example, for weapons, it just says the self-defense mechanisms that we take part in. And then you keep going and it's the photos with the text and things like that. But when I was trying to figure out how to display the text, because I was going through quite a few options before I started making bookmaking, you know, I was like, should I write the text on the wall? Should it be prints of it? And this to me felt like it fit the best with the project and it felt like it paired the text with the photos in the most mm -hmm. simple yet impactful manner. And mm -hmm. so it just seemed to So it, it's really different presenting it in a book or mm -hmm. presenting it on the wall. Yeah. What, what do you feel would have the most impact? I think both, I think both can have a strong impact because I think the text is what is impactful about them. You know, I think if you were to walk in there's another project, I can't place the name of it, but I know um, an old professor of mine showed it to me a few years back, but they hung giant scripts of the stories, and I thought it was a really powerful way to see the work, and I 100%, I love that, <laughs> the way that they did that. Um, to me, I really liked, one moment, I really loved the idea of having it in the, in the book so I could, so people could just read through it and really take their time with it and it also felt more like a archive I guess when it was in the book and I think that was really important to me also yes well, I bought the displays in your okay. can you take off your mask for a sec I bought the displays on the wall but the quotes for basically one sentence mm -hmm. were very effective so is the book uh, does the book have more of the story or roughly yeah. the same yeah the book um so a lot of the titles actually for the works are snippets of the text okay, and so it's like kind of yeah it's taking parts of it but like some of them like i know there's one in here and it's four pages or like oh, or it's a bunch of the one sentence mm -hmm. uh, yeah I, I definitely were really so good to tell the story of that picture I mean, yeah yeah that was a big thing actually picking titles for the project that was a big thing that i spent a lot of time with a lot more than I would a normal title probably, but I really would read through the transcripts and think like what words stood out to me in that. And then I would make like little notes and put post-its on it and then come back to it. And I wanted to pick just very simple 
phrases, but when paired with the photographs, you can tell that they have so much more meaning to them. And so that was something, thank you for noticing that, that was actually something that I did spend quite a bit of time with trying to figure out what I wanted to uh, title. So making that. such a project uh, uh, requires a lot more knowledge about uh, than just photography, I'm not saying just photography. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you started this project before you knew you were going to make a book out of it. Yeah. Uh, is the book the end product or is it just another? I think product? it's just another form of mm -hmm. it. I I still love displaying it, you know, in shows and stuff, but I think they complement each other quite nicely. So, and so would you approach a, a follow-up project differently now that you know there's on-the-wall presentation mm -hmm. and there's potentially book presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think it would all have to depend on the project that I'm making. Um, I do. I love non-traditional forms of like showing art. For example, like in a book, or I've made some like larger hanging like sculpture pieces. Like I, I really enjoy non-traditional displays of work. Um, that was actually something I wrote mainly about throughout my time in school. It was always performance art or mm -hmm. just non-traditional ways of displaying art. And so that's definitely something I've always been really drawn to. Um, but as far as wall versus book and stuff, I think it would definitely have to depend on what the project was going to be. But I do know that I love how books complement physical works and things like that. And so I think photography lends itself really well for a book because it is a reproduction uh, medium mm -hmm. already. And now you can sit on your chair and read it calmly and let it sink in, yeah. as opposed to looking at a wall and standing, reading, and mm -hmm. with somebody behind you. Yeah. Well, and I think something like this, too, like this project specifically, that was a big reason I was drawn to the book format, is because especially the text, if you've ever read through this book, it's a very heavy, very, like, I, I have, like, a note at the beginning I'm like read with like care like it's a very hard book to get through and so I always make that comment because I feel like this is something that is good to just sit with and to take your time with and so I think that's also why I was drawn to the book format is because people can really just take as much time as they need to just read through portions of it and stuff like that. This is made by a new press. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Whose idea was it to have your book as one of the first projects of this particular press? <laughs> that would be Evan Baden. <laughs> so, uh, uh, could you briefly speak to why you wanted to have this book in the, uh, as part of the, the press? I just think that the project is, is pretty powerful and like, um, I mean, I'll say like with with Anna's work and like the amount of text that's included there, like it just makes sense in that format. Um, also because it's just like those spaces can contain so much, whereas like often you know as a, a, a photographic artist you, you don't get to exhibit a, a series in its entirety on this way and, and the book is a space for that. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it was a really kind of nice space and um, yeah. Did your did your learning how to bake to make um, books play into this at all? Because the press can take care of everything from beginning to end. Yeah, I mean, it was it kind of all happened around the same time. It, I took the advanced bookmaking class my last term of school, and I was actually working with Evan a lot on the project already because he taught the course, and so we were all kind of playing with it and then you know I would mess around with different stitching techniques and then we would just kind of bounce ideas off of each other. So and it I was think, synergy. Yeah, yeah, and I think it helped a lot. Yeah. When and where will the book be available? Um, we're hoping it's going to be available by the end of the summer. Um, and you can get it online actually, um, pushpulleditions.com, you can just order them. Um, there's a regular copy, which is just, it's very similar to this. This is kind of like a dummy copy right now. Um, but it's, there's a regular copy, and then there's a collector's edition copy that has a fold out in it with a print as well. But, yeah. A real print. So yeah, yeah, it's an actual print <laughs> that you can like do whatever if, your heart desires was, uh, with it. If it was a, a, 
a painter, it would be a, a painted piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Here's another question. So, yes. I hope this isn't so mundane, but I'm okay. curious because you mentioned the um, the work where you set up this just the photographs of the the content and then shot and then check. I'm curious if the weapons, if any of the weapons photographs were set up that way with a lot of manipulation or, or were they just pretty straightforward? Um, I photographed them in a pretty straightforward manner. I mean, of course, there's like the whole turning to make sure that the lighting's right and that kind of stuff, which I did quite a bit, which was helpful with these because um, all of the weapons ones too, it's the person who owns them or holding them. So you kind of had to do it, and this was always during, or mostly during school, so I always had to make sure that like I kept our times pretty quickly, but uh, yeah, no, normally it was pretty straightforward. I would just kind of, you know, tweak it a little bit so that the lighting was hitting right and that, and I would always take a lot of photos. That was one thing I learned in school. I have hundreds of each of them <laughs> just to choose from, you know, all those little do different you still have them? Oh yeah, oh, no, we never, I never throw away photos. I say we, that's one of the first things I learned in the photo department is you never delete photos. You just back everything up because you never know. Well, A, if you're gonna need it again, B, it's just a good thing to look back on and see how you, your work has changed throughout the years, which. How could I think that that was good <laughs> 10 years later? Well, yeah. I just wanna say the composition of all of them I really was striking. And yeah. so yeah. it seemed like a lot of, yeah, it was a lot of like finessing, <laughs> kind of figuring out how it would fit in the frame the best, yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, but that is why it is art photography and not only documentary. <laughs> the thing that struck me about the weapons was that many of them are common things like car keys. Yeah. So uh, I guess I thought of weapons in a quote, sort of callous kind of format. Now, these are normal things that I, not always normal, but Many of them are normal things I carry with me, and mm -hmm. then they can also serve the purpose of a weapon. They weren't designed to be a weapon, but they yeah. become a way to protect myself. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a very interesting um, juxtaposition. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, that was definitely a consideration when I was trying to figure out what to title even each of the series, and weapons stuck out to me because, like you were saying, like, yeah, they looked like they look like just everyday items, but then they're they're seen as so much more by people who use them in other ways, you know. Well, the tasers are really yeah, that's more of a weapons one for sure. But you know, when it's all hidden in the little pouch in your bag, like you wouldn't think twice about it. And so I thought that that was something really interesting. The um, you have one. Yeah. It just yeah. Me. No, it's. And the photo of the wrists. Oh, oh yeah, one. yeah the. Yeah, that was, um, that was actually one of mine, uh, something that my, and I found out quite a few of the people that I was interviewing also had the exact same thing, but that was something I was told by the, since I was probably six, it could have been before that, I just don't remember anything before that, but that was something my mom always said, she was like, if you're getting attacked by a man, or if a man is trying to take you, you use the heel of your hand and you hit their nose because then they'll be like in a lot of pain, you can like run. Mm -hmm. But it's something so like, mm -hmm. like you don't even think about it, but so many of the people that I talked to were like, oh yeah, I was told the exact same thing growing up. Right. And it's just, it's wild. I, I thought also with the tasers, um, there's two of those photos and they're such kind of cotton candy colors. Uh -huh. You know, they're not, they're, they're an accessory. They're yeah. not, uh, yeah. they're not police grade, mm -hmm. you know, they are meant to Sort of like the pink camera, but then yeah. with a yeah. more creepy content. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it's interesting. It's actually, it's not funny, but it's amusing when you look up um, like tasers or mace or things. It's always like pink and purple and all these, like they know what they're like, that's the group that they're going for, but it's just, it's, yeah. it's, it's very sad. Yeah, 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 it's, it's unfortunate. I, I, I wanted to ask you something else. How is it to be uh, engrossed and, and just focused on one subject matter for four years and going maybe. Yeah, it's and it's, it's not a you know. Oh like yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot. Um, I've definitely taken breaks with the project. Like I'm still, I still always consider myself to be working on it. I'm always taking people's stories. But it's something that I definitely need to watch myself with in taking breaks because it is such a heavy 
subject matter. And I think that it can be a lot, you know, when you're working on a subject matter like this and then you keep seeing things happen, like what you're talking about in the book. And so I think that that's definitely a lot um, to work with as you're just trying to make work and it's such a hard thing to work with. But one thing I will say that I think has been very cool to work with with this subject matter is that there's always a different topic to talk about. Like there's so many, it's such a layered issue I think in our society and so there are so many different facets you can look at and so many things you can talk about. That's like the majority, I, I write any ideas that I have, I write in my sketchbooks. So like it could be for any project ever and I'll like write it down. And there are just so many different ways you can look at and approach this subject matter. And I've written about it in journalism classes and I've photographed for it. And so I feel like there's that variety. So I never really get tired of talking about it. It's also something I'm very passionate about and I have been for quite a few years. And so I enjoy documenting it and bringing and raising awareness about it really. Um, that's something that's always been very satisfying for me and very... Do you think that uh, raising awareness is your goal or would you like to take it a step further? I mean, I do think a big, that's kind of like the core of making work and activist type work is just raising awareness about these issues. Of course, I'd love to see change. Um, we all do, uh, but I love just raising awareness about it because even just making this project over the past few years, there have been people who have come up to me, quite a few men have come up to me and they're like, I had no idea that this was something that people have to deal with. And so it's kind of, it's, it's rewarding in that sense, seeing that people are starting to realize um, the toll that this takes on people. And so I think that that's a big thing with it also, Another reason that I, this project means so much to me is I've interviewed so many people and afterwards they're like, thank you, you're the first person I've ever told mm. about this. Yeah. And so that's a very, it's a lot, <laughs> but it's very, you know, I'm happy that I could be at least somebody how, how for them. Were, were these contacts made? Um, well, when it first started, it was friends. A lot of them were friends, like a couple of my best friends reach out to me and they're like all be somebody in your, because I already knew about a lot of them, but they're like, I'll be somebody, and then like friends would reach out to other friends, and then people would start to see the work at shows, and then they would reach out that way, and so it kind of was a whole spider web effect, mm -hmm. like I would get people from a whole lot of different things, and it just started to grow, really. So what do you balance all this happiness with? I, just in like day to day, I just, I've been getting into painting and drawing and I just do like whenever whenever it's starting to feel a bit heavy I'll think to myself I'm like what art makes me genuinely happy to make I was like and it doesn't matter if it's gonna go in a gallery it doesn't matter it's just gonna stay in my sketchbook what makes me happy to make and so I'll go paint something or I'll go draw something random or I'll go shoot some cam or photos on my film camera and just kind of do things that bring me ease and comfort. And so that's been a really good balance. Um, if it starts to get too heavy, I'll take a week or two off of it where I'm just like, okay, I'll just focus on other things. And so far the balance has been pretty good, I'd mm -hmm. say. It, the, yeah. the work that is coming out of that balance, is that something you think of, well, I, I wanna go and do something with that too? Or do you wanna keep this body of work as your as your core, yeah, the um, work that you're going to be known for at this I, period of time. Yeah, I I definitely see this project as being one that I think will be a substantial work for me for quite some time. I would love to see myself continue to make work just because it's something I started when I feel like I was already so young. So I was 19 when I started it, and so it feels like I'm not even the same person as I was then. And so it's one of those things where I like to imagine that I'll be able to keep growing my work and just making better work and still talk about a lot of the similar subject matters because I am very invested in these type of topics, especially activism type topics. I'm very much passionate about those. Um, and then the side work, sometimes I'll see if I'll do something specific and I'll be like, oh, I could see myself doing something with that similar line of like style or concept or something. Normally it's not that specific work, but it like opens new ideas for what I might 
might do in the future. Well, th thanks for being letting us be one of your side projects last summer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> what was that side project? She, she photographed our live artists for the oh, discovery okay. tour. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was oh, the, all those. The, the, all the, the headshots. Yes, the fun, like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's documentary. Yeah, yeah there you too. go. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I always yeah. love photographing people. <laughs> it, it would be just really nice if there was something that balanced you that you could express to people too. So yeah, you know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The thing that seems your photography of people is very personal photography in the sense that you want to know their story mm -hmm. to include the picture. Do you ever get interested in just people? Um, I tend to like to photograph people when they're not knowing they're being photographed. Yeah. Because they often have um, very interesting expressions or Imagine a story. Do you ever do that as well? Yeah, yeah. So I've I've done some. I know I've had like assignments in the past where it's been like street photography, and you can't they can't know you're taking photos of them, and it's very um, natural, like unaware, like you were saying, like those types of photos. And I do love those. Um, I'm as far as my own like art, like displaying work goes. I'm I've always been more drawn to. Yeah, that connection between me and the person I'm photographing, I think that that's really important for me as far as my documentary projects are concerned. But as far as like everyday photos and just doing, that's that's more of what I like to do just for fun is to take photos of people and to do those types of things. I find that to be really shy. Don't go back to this. Yeah. Uh, what are you most proud of in this project? I'd have to say the book, honestly, at this point, especially now seeing it coming to <laughs> a close and being finished. It's the first time I've seen like the finished product or I'm starting to see it and it's very rewarding, I guess, to see it and to see it all laid out and it's exactly how I, it's, it's better than what I had initially even hoped that it would look like. So I'm just very content and happy with that and just, yeah, that's been really rewarding as well as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, hearing the people that I talked to, hearing them happy that they, that's been the biggest thing, hearing them happy that they had a place or someone to talk to. That's been the, by far the biggest, just, wow, like I'm yeah. happy I could help in that way. And, and Even, start a path to recovery. Yeah, yeah. Potentially. Yeah. 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 Well, um, it's, the audience asked several questions, but if there's nothing now, I would like to ask you my last question. Yes. The if money and space was not something you have to think about, what artwork would you like to own? Yes. So, one series that has been a huge um, influence for me throughout making art, especially in the past few years with this project, what it has been Nan Golden's Ballad of Sexual Dependency photography project. Um, and so I know that these aren't very large, they're small prints, but any work from that series, I think is just so powerful and so stunning. Um, I love the old hard flash with the colorful film and I love all that. So if I had to pick one, it would probably be one from that series. <laughs> I know that's not as ginormous or uh, space consuming, but I'm always a sucker for film photos and stuff. And that series to me just really has impacted me a lot throughout the past few years. So yeah. Well, I would like to thank you uh, for being an artist, for being such a photographer. You know, in heart and soul, we say heart and kidneys. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you really are that. And it's yeah. wonderful to see. I want to congratulate you on the book yeah. and thank you for bringing that. We will be looking forward to when it really comes out. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving your time here. I would encourage people to come and look at this work uh, to see how mundane objects and things can um, 